Well, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have been invited here to talk to you about Stephen Hawking and about um, my experiences writing a book about him, Stephen Hawking, An Unfettered Mind, or as, as it's called in Britain, Stephen Hawking, His Life and Work. Some of you may already know Hawking's science well, and nearly everybody knows something about him as a person. His disability, his legendary courage, his unlikely celebrity, and then a few ugly rumors about him as well. But he's more than a legend or a celebrity. He actually is a real person. And it's been my luck to get to know him just a little bit. I wouldn't claim it would be inaccurate to say that I know him well. In fact, I think it might be inaccurate to say that more than two or three people in the world know Stephen Hawking well, and even they have their doubts. The way he communicates through his computer, using very few words which it takes him a long time to produce, means there's always something of a distance. Um, and his, um, he, he doesn't give very much away. He says exactly what he wants to say and no more. Furthermore, he has no body language, and his synthetic computer voice uh, conveys no emotion whatsoever. When you are sitting with him, you often wonder whether he's telling a joke or not. But he does have facial expressions still. And the people who made that Star Trek episode with him um, had him playing a poker game with, with uh, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein and uh, Star Trek's data, uh, those people were amazed at the variety of his facial expressions, which doesn't sound to me exactly like it would recommend itself that highly for, for a poker game, but uh, evidently he, he impressed them with that. He's lost some of that mobility since then, but he still has that great big wonderful grin. The history of my book, this book, started 18 months ago when Bantam Trance World, who were my publisher in, in Great Britain, um, asked me to update a little book that they had published back in 1991, I think, 20 years ago, called Stephen Hawking, A Quest for a Theory of Everything. At that time, they had published that as a little paperback, and it had become a Times bestseller in Britain. What they wanted now was me to add, uh, update it, maybe add an update chapter, and change it a little bit so that they could make it into an e-book, which had never been done before with this book. I began to work on it and soon realized that um, a little updating and a little tweaking of those earlier chapters really wasn't going to do it. And I ended up writing a whole new book, which cannibalized the old book. It's critical of him in some places, it's not completely complimentary, but he did give his blessing to the writing of it. However, he did, did not have any control about what I said in it. He, I did uh, let him read it, of course, and I, I passed by him all the, the um, quotations that would be used in it. But uh, that's the only control he really had over it. But so much had happened since, uh, since 1989, so much science, so much new material about um, relationships in his life, so much new material about events in his life that had happened before 1989 that I had covered somewhat in the old book, that this had to be a completely new book. Now the research for this book was not entirely in scientific papers, scientific journals, books, interviews, um, newspaper articles in Britain and America. My husband is an academic, and his field is global studies, global economics, global history, global, everything to do with globalism. And we have many friends who go on sabbatical. During the 20 years since I wrote that first book about Stephen Hawking, all these friends sent me clippings about Stephen Hawking from all over the world. And I squirreled them away in a box, and last year I got out the box. So that my bibliography includes things like the South, South China Morning News, uh, the West Australian from Perth, or the Hindu Times, things like that. You might get the impression that Kitty Ferguson really does exhaustive research all over the world and things. But it's all thanks to those clippings that were sent to me. 
Another slightly unorthodox source was Cambridge, England itself, because my husband and I live there for part of every year now, and we have been going there ever since we first went there on sabbatical ourselves in 1986. So we know that town well, and we know a lot of people there. And everywhere you go in Cambridge, you encounter people who have little stories to tell about Stephen Hawking. Unlikely people, the woman who cuts my hair has a relative who was working as a carpenter on a house in Maltings Lane when Stephen Hawking's wheelchair slipped there on the ice and turned over. And this young man was the first to get to him and cover him with a jacket and call the emergency people. Um, someone else had an automobile accident and the driver of the other car was Jane Hawking, Stephen Hawking's first wife. The, uh, a lot of people at the college we were affiliated with there, Claire Hall, recall um, carrying Stephen up and down the stairs there before that college had an elevator for what was called the astronomy group at that time. All these little incidents, it's not, it's not gossip, it's just interesting little incidents. Stephen Hawking has lived in that town for 50 years, and it is a small town. One challenge in writing this book was to be certain I was writing the book Stephen Hawking, an un 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 Unfettered Mind, and not the legend of Stephen Hawking. I think any biographer has an almost irresistible urge to fictionalize their subject. And I do wonder what I did to Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, right? Because it's even more of a problem when it's a historical subject. But there you get all the information together that you can and then you do the best you can. When it's somebody that's still alive, you really have a certain obligation to them to make it a little more real than that, to keep it a little more authentic. And I had the advantage of going in fairly often to talk with him. Not a lot, but occasionally when I had a new book coming out, I would take him a copy. If I was writing something I could ask him a question about sometimes, I would go in for that purpose. So that through the years, and especially when I was writing this book, I would see him in person. And I would think about what I'd written about him, and I would think, no, it isn't quite right. I've gone a little bit astray from the real Stephen Hawking. I've fictionalized him a little bit. It's so easy to do. It's just a choice of a word, the tone of a paragraph, the, um, the urge to make something just a little more dramatic or a little more funny. And it's so easy to do and so hard to resist. I also felt obliged to respect to a certain extent, to a large extent really, his own interpretation of himself in a way that you wouldn't do really with a historical figure. Uh, some reviewers have taken me to task for writing too uncritical a biography. What they would like, I think, is the biography that I might write 15 years after he died, when you really can step back and evaluate a person a little better than you can when they're still alive. But it's not uncritical, it's critical in places. As a matter of fact, I wondered, you know, what he would think of certain places. He's known to get very angry with writers and, and uh, people who try to interpret his life. But there was no mushroom cloud over Cambridge, England, and my invitation to the 70th birthday party was not revoked. So I think it passed muster, or else he didn't read it all. Now, many of you know and have heard that I'm not a mathematician or a scientist by training although science and mathematics have been part of my life since I was a small child. My degrees are in music from the Juilliard School, and I'm very often asked why it was at age 48 that I suddenly decided to put all that aside and start writing books and lecturing about science, science history, and um, um, scientists for the popular market, for intelligent people who aren't scientists. Uh, we all hear that there's somehow a connection between music and, and mathematics, um, but you don't often hear of a musician deciding to write a science book. It's not unheard of. Um, and some people have said, well, perhaps Juilliard had a really outstanding physics department. But no, that's not the reason. That's not it. Um, I never took physics at Juilliard, so I don't know. But it was reading a brief history of time that was the watershed in my life.